So funny story, the water was out at my <laughs> at my house you know, for the whole weekend basically. Yeah. And apparently we had an issue that was going on for six months and we didn't know about this. Uh, so water was basically kind of just you know into the but I don't know into the gutter or something like mm -hmm. this. I'm not know. sure you we, want to we, sit that close to Mikel after no water for the whole yeah. week. <laughs> <laughs> we, we could put it on here and there, so it was like in between, right? But it's, I mean, it's it's literally the, the perfect example of revenue leakage right there, right? We, mm. we would have loved to know it six months earlier than we did in the end. Um, but, you know, I survived. I have I have showered Mikkel today. Well, I've submitted uh, so several complaints internally, So, but now it makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah, we also only spent four <laughs> hours in the studio today, so, you know, <laughs> good that I'm starting with that story now, I guess. Yeah, exactly. But we have a guest here today. Yes, we have uh, Dave Kellogg with us today. Dave, welcome to the show. Welcome, Dave. Yeah. Hi. Welcome, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. A pleasure is all ours. So uh, we were just talking a bit before we hit record that... Both of us, we're avid readers of uh, of Kel Block, uh, where you write quite a lot uh, mm -hmm. when you get the time, at least, is my sense. But they are very uh, thorough, I should say, with even a lot of resources, which I don't think you see a lot in at least some of the stuff that I, <laughs> I tend to read. Um, you're also very passionate about metrics. You are a metrics brother with Ray Reich at the show SAS Talk. Uh, also, another uh, gentleman we uh, really uh, enjoy and follow who also live, loves metrics. There you go. And then your executive in residence at Belterton Capital and amongst other things, scaled, a bu scaled business objects from 30 million to 1 billion. And this is in revenue for everyone that's listening, not in this yeah, so market cap. The, old, the good old days where we measured company size on revenue, not market cap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, and obviously you have, you know, Warren and, you know, had a, had a lot of different hats as CMO, CEO, investor, and, and so forth, advisor. Um, so I think it suffice to say that um, Dave knows a thing or two about scaling commercial engines, scaling SaaS engines, actually. And uh, that's what we want to talk about today. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks. Thanks for being readers of the blog. And, and you're right. That last post I did was seven pages single spaced. So I, I don't want to scare readers away. But once in a while, I do get uh, enthusiastic. And I think it had 10 pretty rich footnotes. So uh, th 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 thanks for reading those who do. And I, I try to keep my little shorter than that in general. Other people call this a bachelor thesis, but I think that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what we've talk with quite a few people about up until this point is really all the challenges that's happened over the last, let's say, 12, 24 months in our industry, B2B SaaS, right? So valuations compressed because of extending sales cycles, ACVs are dropping. And given your view, it would be really interesting to hear what do you see that the great, the great teams out there are doing better than the rest right now? Okay. Well, that's a big question. Why don't we start at the beginning? I think most people are through this now already, but but mm. whenever you come off a very frothy funding environment where capital is kind of free, you, you get very free spending and you get very growth oriented. And that's all great. The, the trick is recognizing the world has changed, which I think people have done. Um, and then the second trick is extending your runway, right? Because the thing we want to try to avoid, well, we have to desperately avoid running out of money <laughs> first. Um, and then second, we want to avoid um, having to raise money under unfavorable conditions. So I think the smart CEOs, and this is more like six, nine months ago, the first thing they did was how do we extend our runway combination? You could do a extension round, you could do a uh, venture debt, you could cut the burn, right? There's a number of ways to extend your runway, but kind of job one was runway extension. Um, that invariably involved cutting back, reducing growth targets. And, and now we're, I think we're squarely in phase two or round two, where it's like, okay, how with reduced money do we get kind of more oomph per uh, sales and marketing dollar to drive growth? So that's where I think we are right now. And that's a huge topic itself. So you can guide me where you want to start. But, but that's what I think has happened as a result of all the ma kind of macro changes. Mm -hmm. And so if we dive into this, right? So in, in other words, I think um, in, in code, you also said, hey, this is about driving efficiencies and finding efficiencies, kind of utilizing them. And um, from, from your perspective, if you, if you look in, you know, uh, you know, into an engine and kind of try and figure out what's wrong, how would you actually go about it? How would you, someone listening to a CRO, maybe as a RevOps leader, how would you tell them, hey, this is actually not up to par with what the best guys are doing out there? And maybe this is one of the opportunities you should be jumping on first. 
Yeah, it's a great question. As usual, very hard. Um, I actually take the opposite approach in my own work. Just, just you know, I, I always say what works because <laughs> we're, we're never sure, right? We look at this whole array of things we're doing to drive growth. And I, I, I think of all sales and marketing as concentric onion. So, so I, I literally try to say, what's the core of our onion? What's the thing that works best? The thing that has always worked for us and presumably is still working for us. And are we putting enough energy into that? So, so to mm -hmm. me, my generic approach to the problem is to not to identify what's not working, but it's to identify what's working and say, how can we do more of that? So I guess you're kind of proven, I'm trying to say what the, the you proven guilty or proven innocent, presumed innocent or presumed guilty. I, I, I guess, um, I guess everybody's presumed guilty at some level, right? Like, I assume everything's not working. Now prove me wrong. What is working? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. the weekly demo is working really, really well. You know, this old standing white paper is working really well. This piece of content is driving a lot of conversions. These AdWords are working well, right? So we can go find out what works well. Because remember, our context is we're cutting back, right? So, so mm -hmm. we're looking for things not to do. And I guess rather than make a list of all the crappy things, <laughs> You know, like imagine we go to a room and like go to a whiteboard and say, okay, let's write everything that's not working, right? I'd rather say, okay, let's draw an onion and say what is working. Let's try and place our various campaigns and initiatives into layers on the onion. Um, that, that's the way I think about it conceptually. Yeah. And I mean, the, the inverse of that is to a degree um, then not doing the outer layers of the onion, right? I mean, isn't isn't that then what this, uh, what is going to lead you to? So inevitably you will end up with taking the stuff that you put, you know, not to the core and basically will cut this away in order to focus on the things that are working out. Yeah, I mean, by analogy, there's a fairly cold-blooded and undoubtedly will be seen as an American approach to layoffs, <laughs> which yeah. is you imagine the entire company in the parking lot and then you invite them back in, right? <laughs> and, and who do we invite back into the building? And this is to a certain extent what I'm doing with all our marketing initiatives. That's why I was doing the presumed guilty, presumed innocent. Okay, let's put everything in the parking lot like, so it's all gone. We're not doing any of it. Now, what do we bring in? And yes, to your point, we kind of stop bringing stuff in when we're out of money, right? We say, yeah. okay, we can afford to do this level zero stuff and this level one stuff. Guess we can't afford to do the other stuff. Obviously, you need to sanity check that, particularly in my world. In marketing, a lot of things have indirect benefits. And this is where I think non-marketers can get into trouble because they may just do the first order analysis and leave, I don't yeah. know, I'll pick a tough example, social media. You'll leave social media in the parking lot, say let's fire the social media person. And that may have second order effects, right? In our attribution system, it may not show up as doing much at the first order. So so I, I support this approach, but, it, but I'd say two things, it has to be done by somebody who really understands marketing and these interrelationships. And two, I like doing it after we've done a reverse touch analysis where, where we say, wait a minute, we've got our attribution models, which are all kind of forward looking models. I like to do a reverse model as well and say, let's look at the five favorite deals from last quarter and what were all their touches. And now that we have all that attribution data in our head, all our reverse touch data in our head, we put everything in the parking lot and invite it back in. But yes, long way of saying some stuff gets left in the parking lot. <laughs> so, and you know, we were, we were obviously kind of scanning again and again, your, your LinkedIn profile and you know, you were, you were running as a CMO of business objects, uh, also when the dot com bubble burst, right? Are there any, any, and I've, you know, obviously it was an insanely, you know, successful company, especially for, you know, back then. Um, are there any learnings where you would say like, Hey, this stuff that we went through in the dot com you know, was applicable in 2000, what is it, eight, nine, kind of the, the, the other crisis in between. And it's yeah. also applicable now. Are there things where you're like, hey, this is, this is the, 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 the back to basic stuff that we did in 2001 that people have completely forgotten by now? Look, as I've managed through two crises, crises uh, one, business objects bubble burst as CMO, and then 2008, Mark Logic as CEO. Um, and we can talk about each of those. I think... I'll tell you a funny story from 2002. Like we missed EPS. We were a public company when the bubble mm -hmm. burst. Um, and we missed earnings per share by like a penny. And this is just a funny story. Cause like, oh, we're off by a penny. How big a deal can that be? And like the stock, you know, falls some enormous <laughs> percentage. But the thing that was less obvious to me was the analyst all turned on me. Um, particularly the financial analysts. They're like, you're in the penalty box. It's like hockey, right? You're in the penalty box for eight quarters. It was like, you know, missing earnings, slashing, <laughs> eight quarters, penalty box. And literally, they didn't want to hear what you had to say. So I think it, the thing I most remember for that time period was all the analysts saying, 
if revenue growth is off, if profit is off, therefore your strategy is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's almost an inverse relationship, right? When you're making numbers and growing fast, you're a genius. This is what I would say, hey, I'm the same guy. I was a genius two quarters ago when we were making numbers, uh, mm -hmm. and now we missed by a penny a share, and I'm, I'm no longer a genius, apparently. So, so I think corporate credibility is, is overly tied to financial performance. And by the way, this is why startups try to hype their performance so much, not only for valuation, but also to get the world believing they have a great strategy, right? Because yeah. the, the results are proof of the strategy, if you will. So that was the first thing I remembered is that nobody believed what we said anymore. Um, and, and it was hard because uh, at least in enterprise software, analysts matter a lot and, and corporate credibility matters a lot. From a marketing programs perspective, I don't remember anything you know, we had always built the onion. I'd always had the onion view. Um, so you just naturally scale it back. Sorry, tapping the mic. Um, you naturally just scale back. Um, for example, I, I was just going to go back to the onion because it's my favorite onion story. Hmm. We started a weekly demo. We never stopped, right? And that's literally when I start these, when I started that marketing program, it was like, we're going to do this demo every week for the rest of our lives, right? <laughs> right, and that's, the, that's what it means to run an Onion strategy, right? And most startups I work with today, I still say the same thing. Do we have a weekly demo? So we have a bunch of prospects who are interested in seeing our stuff. Are we going to ask 37 sales reps to do 37 calls next week, each kind of spinning plates while they try to do discovery while demoing the software, right? Are, are we going to do that? Are we just going to round everybody up and do one really good live demo with our best demoer? Um, and we started that in Business Objects UK, and we never stopped. So, so that's mm -hmm. why I think about the onion. Like you, like when you start a program at level zero, the onion, it's forever, <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, and unless something major changes. So because we kind of had that onion philosophy, I don't remember anything that much that we scaled back. You know, our, our planning philosophy was always three major themes for the quarter, plus three major ongoing themes, plus a whole stack of programs, and we dialed the programs back and forth. Actually, I knew, do remember one thing. It took me a while to get warmed up. The biggest thing we changed at that time is we went more to a program in a box model, which is we had run a pretty decentralized marketing team, but the cost pressure said, wait a minute, we have to go build programs typically in the US, but not always, and then export them. Mm -hmm. So so we, we I would say it was also a time where we centralized more of our marketing campaigns because we had been an unusually decentralized company. Mm -hmm. In 2008, what I learned was, you while you need to look out the window and pay attention to the weather, you need to also look at what's happening to you. And this is why having leading, indi leading indicators and good metrics is so important. Because as it turned out, for my customers in 2008, I sold largely to the US government and to media companies. The government was largely unaffected and the media companies were in so much trouble anyway that it didn't matter. <laughs> uh, that, that they were buying my product as a last resort to save them from Google and, and the internet. Um, so we actually raised money in 2008. The, the board came to me and said, Dave, I think you're being too conservative. And I'm like, well, I'm conservative because I'm looking out the window and it's really scary out there. And I'm, it was a Sequoia-backed company. It's like, I'm conservative because I went to the stuck pig meeting and sat in the first row and you told me, quote, to cut deeper than I can, cut as deep as I could possibly imagine and then cut more. That's an actual quote from the meeting. So, so you guys tell me that. I look out the window and it's terrifying. But when I look at my KPIs, it's not terrifying. So, so maybe I sh I'm pulling back because of what I'm seeing out the window, not because of what I'm seeing at my dashboard. And we actually agreed that the dashboard mattered more. They gave me more money so I could feel comfortable. We did an extension round so I could feel comfortable keeping the gas on. So I think that's the other thing I'd say about these downturns is you really, you need to look out the window and go, wow, it's pretty scary out there. But then you need to, hopefully you have good metrics so you can look at your dashboards and say, now what's happening to me? Um, which is kind of a segue to your question. Uh, yeah, so uh, the other step is kind of when you go into planning for next year, right? There's always a number you want to put forward. And the question is really what what is a great number? You can you, yeah, you know, yeah, put yeah. whatever whatever forward, yeah. right? But if you're at 50, 50 million and you're growing at 35%, how do you know whether that's actually good or bad? Yeah, for yeah, yeah that's a great question. Thank you for re-asking it. Um, this was something that kind of made me unpopular at, at Business Objects, in fact, and I've stuck with my whole life, which is every quarter at Business Objects, I presented a graph in the ops review that was our revenue divided by our competitors' revenue. Um, so we were always a flat line. In some ways, it was the most boring chart in the world, right? Because we were flat always, definitionally, because mm -hmm. it's us divided by us. Um, but the interesting part is look at the other people divided by us, right? And if somebody's climbing on that chart, it means they're gaining relative market share. And if somebody's declining in that chart, it means they're losing relative market share. We're gaining on them. So uh, the chart is actually very simple, but super powerful. 
And the reason it may be unpopular, it was because that's a marketing guy's view on the market, right? I care about market share. So to me, winning is winning in the market. Mm. To our CRO and to our country managers, winning was beating plan, right? This cuts right to your question, right? Which is for them, hey, if I negotiate 40% growth and grow at 42%, I'm a hero. And I make, you know, over my compensation and... And I'd be like, well, that's good for you. But if the market grew 60% in your territory, we lost share. And, and we're rewarding you for losing share, which is insanity, right? Um, now, look, now that companies are stay private so long, it's harder to get that data. Because back in the day, people go public at 30 to 50 million. So people weren't very big. And you could get like a geographic breakdown of their financials publicly that was accurate. Right. It's much harder to do this analysis now, but the same principle applies, which is kind of what is winning um, and what is good. And is, is $30 million next year? Is that, is that a great number? Is it a crazy number? Um, so, so the tests I would apply, I think I'd apply two tests. One is what does it do to my relative market share? And if we're saying we want to be the leader in this greenfield market and we're growing, you know, and we're growing slower than our competitor, that, you know, that's a problem. Right? It's a big, or if we're smaller than our competitor and growing slower, well, that's a big problem because we're behind and getting behind her, right? So, so, so we need to be realistic. So, so one way I evaluate that number, evaluate that number, is on a kind of relative market share basis, the best we can to approximate it. The other way is just a doability basis. You know, given our metrics, given our models, given our history, is it doable? Because mm -hmm. you know, a CEO, former CEO, you get fired for missing plan, basically, right? Like Mike, Mike Moritz said, seven words that changed my life. Make a plan that you can beat, um, and I think that's important because while these guys swing for the fences, they want you to be on plan while you're doing it, right? In some ways, Sequoia saying that is very telling because you know they want a grand slam, but they also want you making plan because they want you in control while you're doing that. And and how do you tackle this, right? And maybe this is more of a CEO question actually, but. Uh... I mean, if you if you go out and fundraise from you know, let's just say a Sequoia, um, uh, in in order to secure this, you obviously need to show fantastic growth. You're kind of locking yourself also then in into this path. Yep. <clears throat> Stuff changes. Maybe some of the assumptions, some of the KPIs that you thought would be rosy didn't turn out to be like that. Yep. How do you uh, navigate that? Building a plan that you can hit or beat, uh, yep. you know, without without uh, trying to tweak it in a way that you can sell it to your investors? So it, it is a really hard question. Um, I think the reality is when you're fundraising, you need to put out a fairly aggressive plan uh, and you want to raise a lot of money. But like it or not, and I don't necessarily like it, today's Silicon Valley in SaaS, you need to raise a lot of money because we're, we're competing to buy customers, in effect. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so if you have to go buy a bunch of customers, you need a bunch of money. Um, so the question is, what do we do in terms of aggress aggressiveness? And the answer is I would show a pretty aggressive forward plan. I don't know, 70% confident I can hit it, right? I don't want to show 95% confident I can hit it because it's not aggressive enough. I don't want to show 50-50 because it's probably too unaggressive. So if I have to pick a number out of the air, I'd say a fundraising plan is probably a 70 to 80% plan. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say a forecast to the board is a 90%, maybe 95 at the CEO level. Right. So, so if I'm in a quarter forecasting that quarter, right, I'm not building a model the next three years, but I'm in a quarter and I say we're going to do this much. That's my forecast. I need to hit that at least nine out of 10 times, maybe 9.5. So to me, I attach this notion of confidence interval to a plan, as you can tell. Um, so I, I think the there's, there's two questions in there. One, I would just say, do can we quantify somehow our confidence in a plan? And the answer is yes. And that dial is not always set the same. For fundraising, I'm gonna set it lower. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for like a quarterly forecast, I'm gonna set it higher. Mm -hmm. um, and then the question, the other question is, well, I would say I raise a lot of money off a pretty aggressive plan and now things change. What do I do? Uh, and the answer to me is you, the, the short answer is when you raise money when you can, um, and then you spend it when the indicators say. So, I don't view that three-year plan that I even call it a model just to, to remind people it's not a plan because a, a plan, to me, the semantics of the word plan are something that I pitched to a board that they agreed to. It's for a year and I'm accountable for executing. That's what I call a plan and a plan is one year. Anything beyond one year is a model. So we say, hey, that's the model. That's the trajectory we want to go for. Yeah, I'm pretty sure 70, 80% we can do it, but an operating plan, I'm going to be 90% plus sure we can do it. 
Um, so the question would be, if I raise money in year one, we hit year two and things have changed a lot, what do I do? I'm going to show an operating plan that I'm 90% convinced I can hit. And the reason I do that is I was, I've even said this to the board, you can fire me now or you can fire me later. You know, I'm not a founder CEO. I don't, I don't have what I call the invisibility cloak that the founders sometimes get <laughs> where they can hide. As a hired CEO, you have no such cloak. If you misplan too many times, you get fired. So I'm like, you're going to fire me later. You may as well fire me now. Um, I can't do, if I said we're going to do 100 and I think we can do 80, I'm going to tell you we can do 80. And I'm going to be 90% sure we can do it. Right, because I want to get fired for not doing eighty, not for not doing a hundred. So, so that's how I think about that. I mean, so the there's obviously also then a step where you need to take this to your teams at the end of the day and build the plan. And we were just joking a bit about it. Usually, the planning step happens, you know, February, and people get uh, forty eight hours to review a model somewhere in a spreadsheet, and then everyone gets coerced into into a target, basically, right? Yeah. So how um, how do you see, uh, also because you've talked a lot about this theme as well, how do you see the best steps companies should take as they look for 2024 in order to start building this model and build these plans for next year? So, so look, I, I have a different view on planning. I, I try never to do what you said. I, I, my first company, by the way, my first job, I'll, I'll describe the budgeting process. Uh, they said, Dave, how much money do you need next year to do what we need to do? And I came back and said, 200 units. And they said, just kidding, you only get 105. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that was that was effing depressing, right? I mean, what a huge waste of energy. I get all excited. We make all these plans, and then they give me a top-down target in the end. So the first thing to do is never subject someone to that emotional roller coaster, right? It's mm -hmm. just it's, it's cruel and stupid and wasteful um, and demotivating. So uh, the other thing at that company is the plan would get approved literally in June. And we were on a calendar fiscal year. So we'd be six mm -hmm. months late on approving our own plan. So total lack of discipline. So so those two things stuck with me for 30 years. I said, I, I'm never going to do that. I, I never want to be that company. So I actually start the planning process typically in August or September. I start it with a strategic offsite. It, it's, we can talk about strategy, but strategy is the art of figuring out where you are, which is incredibly difficult. Like figuring out where you are and what's happening around you, That that's 90% of the work. And then the 10% is, okay, given that, what are we going to do about it? Um, so I would start with the strategy offsite at that strategy offsite. I would talk about the financial model and say, this is the model we raised money on. This is what we told people we're trying to do. Do we want to do more? Do we want to do less? Right. Cause, cause now we're, we're at the, we're, that that's, that's going to become a budget by December 31st, that, that model, that thing that we're only loosely accountable for is become going to become a plan slash budget to which we are highly accountable. Um, so how do we want to change it? So, so I tend to take a Delta off the model, right? If you have a long run model, you can always start next year's budget by saying, Hey, here's the model we showed people. What do we want to do more of? What do we want to do less of? Um, so, so my planning process personally is August, you know, three to five day strategy offsite. It's good for team building and stuff, get strategic goals, work on the org chart, get a first, first line financial model. Then in September, October, you come back and say, give me your first round budgets. Then we get together and talk about how they roll up. Then November, December, you're socializing it to the board. Very important step, right? You don't just show up at a board meeting. You, you, in my opinion, meet individually with each board member and say, here's the plan we're looking at. Here's why. Do you have any questions? You do any final tweaks based on that. And then you show up at the board meeting, you know, end of the year and, and try and get it approved subject to, you know, the actual financials for December. Um, but, but that's the process I use. Would you, I mean, so listening to you, it almost sounded like you, you started from the bottom up model um, and never really had a, you know, what other people would say a top down one. Did I, did I catch this right or did I miss something there in, in translation? People use those terms differently. I, I would actually call it a top-down model. My, my three to five year financial model is what I would call a top-down driver-based model. And that is the thing I show people when I'm raising money, right? So, so I've got a top-down model. I'm a huge believer in driver-based planning for, for mm -hmm. a bunch of reasons. Uh, it, it, pr actually, primarily for scenario analysis. What if we could change the sales ramp? Right, if we could go 10, 30, 60, 100, rather than 10, 20, 40, 70, 100, right? What mm -hmm. if we could change the ramp? What if we could change productivity? What if we could change our rep to SC ratio, our rep to SDR ratio, right? It allows you to play with all those drivers and see the actual impact on growth in cash. So, so I definitely, definitely, definitely have a top-down model. I've used some scenario of that model to raise money. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, as we go into you know, let's just say 2024, I'd be looking at how we're tracking on 2023. I'd whip out the financial model and say, guys, when we got the budget approved last year in December of 2023, here's the model we showed them for 2024, 
right? So I would revise that model at that time. Every time I show a plan for a year, I show a new three-year model for the next three years because I'm, I'm trying not to drive looking at the hood ornament, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the risk as a CEO, right? It's kind of like the risk of agile development. You drive looking at the hood. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to, you know, CEO, you want to be up looking out over the trajectory we're getting on. The, the other reason you do that, by the way, is it kills gainsmanship. Because the easiest hack is just not to invest in the second half of the year. So we look profitable, cash flow looks better, but then we've teed up no resources for growth in the following year. Hmm. And, and if you're showing a model that doves tail to your proposed plan, you can't do that. Yeah. And the, um, so you, you take this driver based uh, approach, and you know, that probably also includes, you know, besides new resources for sales and, you know, marketing and so forth. It probably also includes some of those uh, improvement projects almost that you've been mentioning there, right? Kind of, hey, what, what happens if we can cut down ramp and so forth? How do you balance this out? How do you get to the right, um, to the right approach here by not being too aggressive on those assumptions? Kind of, how, how, do, you, how do you build this out? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so look, typically to me, and I've, I've literally done this because it is a host analytics now called Planful. When I joined, our customer acquisition cost ratio was well over four, I can't remember, it was four or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I got it down to one and a half, let's just say. Um, so so I, I did a lot to reduce customer acquisition cost. Um, and the way you do that in my mind is uh, incrementally, like relentless focus. Like you say, okay, last year the CAC was two, next year let's get it to 1.8, because two years from now we're trying to get it to 1.4, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's not gonna go from 1.8 to 1.4 overnight, so what are we gonna do to get it from 1.8 to 1.4? That's all in the model. Hey, if we could get sales productivity up this much, or if we could short, you know, shorten the sales cycle by that much, or increase the deal size by this much, right? These are all things we could do um, to improve sales productivity that would ultimately improve the CAC. Uh, more expansion, right, would also improve yeah. the CAC ratio, the, bl the blended CAC at least. So, so then you, the risk in that process is what I call the Excel-induced hallucination, that you make like seven seemingly little changes and they all compound into going from, you know, 2.2 .2 to 1.1 overnight. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and somebody has to go, wait a minute, that's it. We had a sanity check this. That's insanity. It's not going to happen. Um, that's the wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is really, it's not to change every lever a little, because that, that's what that's the slippery slope into the hallucination. It's to focus on changing like one or two levers a fair bit and making somebody own it and saying, okay, we're, we're not going to play math games and change seven levers 10%. We're going to change average deal size by 20%. And here's how we're going to do it. We're going to introduce a new add-on product. We're going to introduce a new discounting program. We're going to target larger customers. And then you make somebody accountable for that lever. You, you be, right? Because the CAC is a result, right? If you, there was an expression that you don't win the game by staring at the scoreboard, right? <laughs> so, so I can stare at, at the CAC ratio and nothing's going to change. Whereas if I, if I use this model to say, okay, there, there's a whole bunch of different ways we could improve our CAC ratio. Next year, we know the trajectory. We're trying to get from 2.0 to 1.8 to 1.6 to 1.4. So we agree that we're doing that because we kind of have to do that. Um, next year, what are we going to do? And, and then that, that's one of the things you talk about the strategy offsite. And we say, who's going to own that? Who's going to be accountable for making sure this goes up? Um, so, so that's the way I approach it. And what if in, in this scenario, one of the things we at least have discussed quite a bit internally is there's going to be the point in time where someone, a CRO, VP sales, CMO, they look at that model with the assumptions and the owners and still go, hey, I just don't see that happening, right? How do you manage that conversation? Like, how do, you, how, how do they start managing upwards to make sure, you know, you take the right steps as, as a team? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so look, that rule I applied, you can fire me now or fire me later, it works up and down the chain, <laughs> right? And we all have to do it. The CRO needs to look at me and say, I don't believe. And maybe it's the Excel hallucination. Maybe it's I don't believe the new product's going to ship on time. But, but whatever assumptions you're making, maybe it's productivity. We think we can take productivity up from 1 million per rep per year to 1.1. At some point as an executive, you need to make that same decision. Um, and I think too often CEOs and boards, some ways don't give the execs a chance to make that decision. They just say, here's your target, go do it, step up, you know, yeah. be the dude, be the man, be the person, you know, go for it. 
and I think it's a very important step missing in the cycle, which, which is commitment, which is, can you do this? Do you believe you can do this? If yes, say yes. If no, say no. And, and maybe I'll have to go back to the board and propose a different plan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but you're going to have to convince me. And, and by the way, the, the answer is always, and this is the same thing they do to a hired CEO. If you don't believe it, I'll, I'll go find somebody who does, right? Or sorry, <laughs> I might go find somebody who does. You, 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 I have to decide, right? Either, you know what, Dave might be right about this. Maybe we can't go this fast. Or it might be, if you don't believe you can do it, I'll go find, let's go find somebody who thinks they can. And that, that applies up and down the chain. So um, I do think it's a super important part of the plan. And I think most startups leave it out to your point. They just kind of say, here are the numbers. This is what the board said. Got to go. Yeah. And it's almost, you know, sometimes sometimes we see this as almost a let's just nod to it uh, today and uh, in, in August and September, October, whenever you're creating the plan. Uh, you know, it's future Tony's problem then, you know, in Q3 next year to then sit there and not be able to to hit those numbers, right? But this also goes back to your point of, well, you need to create a plan that you can beat, right? So it's, a, it's very much a you want to you want to take the friction now instead of just writing it out now, keeping it easy in the planning and maybe Q1, Q2, and then getting hit with that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love the, the future Tony. Uh, yeah, future Tony becomes present Tony pretty darn quick in my experience. Um, <laughs> so uh, I agree with you, by the way. The other part of this culturally you reminded me of is usually to get to the plan, you have to cut some stuff. So, so I want to make an incremental investments list. As we're making the plan, I want to say, you know what? That thing we wanted to do, we can't afford to do it. We're going to put it on the list. And we're going to have a list of spending, the things we want to spend money on, basically. Um, and if we can get ahead of plan, we'll go spend money on it, right? Because part of making a plan you can beat is you can actually get ahead of it, right? When you have a plan that you have very little hope of attaining, you're never ahead of it. You're always chasing it. Right. You're always behind. You're always forecasting upside down more than your pipeline conversion. Right. You're always chasing plan and chasing plan is a horrible way to live. Um, but when you actually make this transition to making a plan you can beat, all of a sudden you're like, hey, wait a minute. You know, we're forecasting more than plan. Or we've got too much pipeline coverage. Maybe we can do some of those things we want to do. Right. So because so, people act like that never happens. And the reason it never happens is because you're always chasing plan. Um, right. But if, if you have a plan that you can beat, then you actually do. I can't, I can't, there's a name for that list at Salesforce. I can't remember what we called it, but there's a name for the list of stuff you want to spend money on. And, and you can actually take stuff off that list and do it when you're getting ahead of plan. It's called the wish list at Amazon, by the way. The. Um, you know, one one of one of the the things that was going on in my head was also, we talked about the CEO, the board, the CRO. You know, he said it goes up and down the chain. You know, with the different VPs, I guess as well. Where do you see RevOps in this whole in this whole conundrum here? What yeah. what what role do they play? And, and you know, maybe it's not the uh, Salesforce system admin RevOps necessarily that we're talking about here, but really sure. when it comes to the planning and the planning execution. Where do you see RevOps come in? Where do you see FP&A or commercial FP&A come in? What is your yeah. perspective on all of these topics? Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so RevOps to me, I mean, to me, it's an awesome, you have the chance to be the Mr. Spock using the Star Trek metaphor, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the trusted quantitative advisor that everybody trusts. Right, that the CFO trusts, that the VP of sales trusts, that the CEO trusts. That to me is the perfect RevOps person mm. because they are all about the data. They're kind of dispassionate and unemotional about the data, right? Hey, it's just the facts. I'm telling you about the weather. I didn't make the weather, but I'm telling you about it. It's raining. Mm. You may not like that. I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but it's raining. Um, so they have the chance to be this kind of dispassionate analyst and trusted advisor to everybody. They can be neutral in some ways, which is super powerful. If right, there, there's the case where they're just seen as you know the cage fighting partner of the CRO, mm -hmm. right? And so, when this doesn't work, I call it a cage fight where you have the CFO versus the CRO, and they tap in and out with their ops person, right? Mm -hmm. I'm tired, yeah. so I tap in my ops person, they tap <laughs> out and tap me back in. So it's a, you know, a tag team cage fight when it doesn't work. What it does work, which is often in my experience, RevOps has this really privileged position that FP&A, I don't know why, FP&A should also have it, but I, to the, here's the difference. FP&A is always trusted by the CFO. I don't know if they're trusted by everybody. And, and RevOps can actually, because they're, I don't know, they're more in the middle. 
Um, and certainly they can just be seen as the CRO's right hand and, and, and not be trusted. But but look, I've seen it work many times where they are trusted and they're seen as kind of everybody's right hand. And and so I think they can play a, a crucial role in planning, answering questions like first, doability. Like, can we do this? Second, the lever analysis. Like right there, first person I would go to is can we get productivity up by 10%? How? Um, okay, sales enablement is going to own it. What are they going to do? Do we believe it'll move that much? Do we have any historical data that says it can. Hey, I noticed that if we hire people from Salesforce, they tend to ramp faster. Ooh, um, that might help us with their ramping, right? So, hey, there's this new tool we can use to help us be more productive in, in enablement or onboarding or uh, whatever, prosecuting leads. So I think RevOps, broadly defined, could be instrumental in the planning process as kind of a, a neutral source to ke kind of keep everybody calm and, and tell the CFO, yes, we can do this. Trust me, right? Yeah, I know the sales guy's excitable. The salesperson's mm -hmm. excitable. <laughs> you may not believe them, but but this is backed up. We can do these numbers, right? And, and you can tell marketing, hey, this is what we need you to shoot for in terms of pipeline goals. Uh, second opinion for the CEO on like, can we do it? I mean, I personally, I would always look at FP&A that way and RevOps. When I was a CEO, I had, mm -hmm. I had close relationships with both and I trusted both. Um, I would tend to go to the FP&A person for like the more financial questions, right? Like if we hit the bookings targets and, and if we hit our expense targets, what's it going to mean for cash? How much runway do we have? What kind of valuation do you think we can raise money at two years from now? They, I would tend to have that conversation with the FP&A person. Mm -hmm. And I would, with the RevOps person, it was much more about can we, can we do this? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and what can we change to do it? And where can we squeeze? Do, do we really need this, you know, pet project or pet person? Um, so, so in long story short, trusted advisor, and uh, I think it's a great job. And this is, as you know, from my 2023 predictions, I'm predicting unified RevOps because unified RevOps can do this. It, 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 the tag team cage fight happens when there's marketing ops and success ops and PS mm -hmm. ops and, and sales ops. And th then we tend to degenerate to the cage fight. <laughs> but when there's one unified RevOps team, you tend not to. No, absolutely right. And I also, I mean, you and I talked about this before, but, you know, people are now starting to refer to it as unified revenue operations. And, you know, it's it's the new way to say revenue operations, I feel. But it's I think it's I think it's important to clarify that actually uh, currently, at least. Yeah, to ascend up the stairs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> unified RevOps. Yeah, 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 it's arguably redundant, but but I say it anyway, because uh, I, I mean, as distinct from sales ops, just called RevOps. Yeah. Should we do, I have one more question because in this whole planning uh, conversation, there's one element we didn't talk much about yet. And I do know it's a question we get, especially actually funny enough from revenue operations, it's really around, well, how do you then go about allocating all those resources? All kinds of questions appear all of a sudden, what should the split be between sales and marketing? How do we go about distributing cash, cash on all these channels? Yeah. What Can you maybe provide some direction for those wonderful folks listening out there ahead of, planning how should they consider you know going about allocating resources i mean so here's the way i like to do it if you're fortunate enough to have some history the history can be super helpful first um so so how much do we spend on sales and marketing or sales versus marketing well let's look at my sales percent of sales and marketing expense and let's watch how that changes over time and on that particular metric i will tell you by default it goes up because sales is a better negotiator than marketing and they have more leverage so in everything else being equal, that ratio will go up over time. And at some point that will create a problem because there won't be enough marketing to support sales. Sales kind of wished its way into, you know, shooting its foot off. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just an example of a, of a metric. You can use history and use metrics like, like, you know, how much are we spending cost per opportunity, cost per lead? Why is it changing? You know, why next year do we think we can get this fantastic improvement in cost per opportunity? while at the same time sales as a percent of sales and marketing is increasing, right? So we're kind of fattening up sales and we're skinnying down marketing. And obviously I have 10 plus years as a CMO to bias me in this, but <laughs> I've also been a CEO for 10 years. Um, you, you watch this trend happen. It took, it took me that long to figure out why it changes, by the way, but just marketing people are just not, I mean, you, if your marketing person was a better negotiator than your sales VP, you have a different problem, right? So, so, so this is gonna happen. Um, so the first thing I do is I look at the history, very important all those metrics. Uh, the next thing I do personally is look at benchmarks. So what are other people doing? Mm -hmm. um, then I look at our aspirations, kind of given our history and given our benchmarks, what do we want to do? 
The other thing I encourage doing, which I don't know if people are as disciplined about this as I am, but but I always try and separate the sales force into different models. Let's just say we had 10 salespeople and two were mostly enterprise and one was kind of hybrid and six were or seven were uh, inside, right? Rather than model an average of that, I would actually strip it and say, wait a minute, we actually have, I'm going to impose clarity <laughs> and say, we need to separate this into different sales models because the sale to me is, I always think of a sales model as roles, ratios, and goals, roles, goals, and ratios. Um, so, so what's the role? Okay, so, so we have salespeople, we have SDRs, we have you know BDRs maybe, we have solution consultants, we have managers, we have alliances people, right? What are the ratios? Because in my mind, every model might get differently. Like an enterprise, you're going to run with a high support ratio, like relatively a lot of SDRs and a lot of um, SEs. Whereas an inside sales, you might run with no SEs, right? If it's a pure inside corporate model. So... And the main thing I'm trying to do here is the advice to the RevOps planner is even if your world is hazy and murky and homogeneous, can you separate it? Can you say, wait a minute, if I put a filter on this, it's not perfect without the filter, but if I filter it, there's actually an inside model where we have these people that tend to have, because say it's all super ad hoc, everybody's got a different quota, everyone's got a different territory, right? Reality is just gray as heck. I can, if I can look at it and go, these people are mostly inside, these people are mostly outside, these people have high quotas, they use a lot of resources. Because what I want to do as a modeler is separate into two or three sales models and say we don't have one sales model. We have three sales model. We have an inside direct model. We have an enterprise model and we're running a hybrid model. And maybe we have a channels model. And even though maybe we only have 20, 25 reps, we're actually running four models, which maybe we shouldn't have quite so many models if we only have 25 reps. <laughs> Different question. But but we're running models in parallel, and we need to model them differently. I think that helps you enormously in the planning process. I think it also helps you enormously in analytics. Mm -hmm. So if I – imposing clarity or imposing simplicity. It's something I say marketing people have to do. I, I think rev ops and planners need to do that. And just say, yeah, I know everyone's different and every patch is different and every every day, I know all that. We're actually running three models here. And here's how I model them. Wow. Dave, you said models more often and faster than I do. So I think that's a <laughs> it's keyword. I love modeling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will have to, you know, to transcribe it and put it on SEM, you know, so we, we need to know. So we met. Uh, <laughs> We met CEO Dave, the CMO Dave, the RevOps Dave. It's like the modeler Dave. The model Dave. Yeah. It's uh, pretty amazing how much you can get through in an episode. But I, I mean, I think there was a bunch of great elements. Do you want to squeeze the last one in? Was that it or? So I was, yes. <laughs> you know, we, ha we have like four minutes time. We said we are not maybe, you know, in a squeeze. Um, we might run out of battery, by the way. I was getting nervous about this. But uh, no, we're good. Um, so all the modeling is done. Cool, done, model done, plan done, budget locked in. Now, first of January comes around. What are your like best practices at actually getting that, getting that you know plan executed? Right, it's when you think about this as a strategic project. Right, the project is to hit that revenue number. How do you best manage that through the years so you actually end where you thought you're gonna end? Yeah, and I, th I think the answer is, I mean, in two words, avoid surprises. Uh, most surprises aren't. Right? Like, oh God, we missed the number because we didn't have sales capacity. Well, why that happened? Because two people we thought were going to quit, quit, and we didn't hire anybody else. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, so like how much of a surprise is that? So I think if you kind of go through your business life and look at all the surprises and figure out which ones weren't, like, hey, we knew those two people were unhappy. We could have easily counted on one of them quitting for sure. Why mm -hmm. didn't we spin up a, a recruiting cycle to replace them so that if one of the two, even though we didn't know which one was going to quit, we thought one was, that we had somebody in backfill. And by the way, mm -hmm. corporate processes often get in the way of that, right? So I guess the other thing I'd say is eliminate excuses, which is if the VP of sales goes to HR and says, I want to spin up a recruiting cycle, and HR says, no, there's no headcount rec approved, I want the, the CRO to win and say, hey, this is my budget. I'm gonna, when we actually want to hire the person, we'll talk about the rec and I'll get Dave's approval. And by the way, Dave will let me go one over just in case no one quits. <laughs> but I want you to spin this up right now. And I don't want to have HR basically say, if there's no plan approved headcount, we can't start a recruiting cycle because I run the department and I think these two people are going to quit. 
And by the way, if they don't quit and I get ahead of plan, we're going to go invest anyway, see the, the prior discussion about on list. So I, I think a shocking number of things in business are not surprises, which goes back to the don't drive looking at the hood ornament. If you're looking up, right, if you're looking at your pipeline, looking at your two quarter out pipeline, looking at your sales, hiring and attrition, right? If you're looking at all those metrics, the, you know, that the way you make plan is don't get surprised. Yeah. And a lot of surprises aren't. So, so I don't have any magic other than that. It's just kind of driving with your head up. I think that's it. Thanks, Dave. That was fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dave, for joining. Thanks for having me, guys. Sure. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, goodbye. <laughs> 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 <Jesus>. <laughs> bye. 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 <laughs>